We'll turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'm, I'm guessing you've already seen that. 2 Timothy 4. And I want to share with you a message today about finish the course. Finish the course. It's not how you start, it's how you finish, right? Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Look beginning in verse 6. For I am ready, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is close. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. There is reserved for me in the future the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who loved his appearing. Make every effort to come to me soon. Paul is writing to his son in the ministry, young Timothy, and he's telling him, I need you, come soon. So he says, make every effort, be diligent to make every effort to come to me soon, for Demas has deserted me because he loved this present world and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Bring Mark with you, for he is useful to me in the ministry. I have sent Tychicus to Ephesus. And when you come, bring the cloak that I left in Troas with Carpus and with the scrolls, especially the parchments, as well as the scrolls, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did great harm to me. The Lord will repay him according to his works. Watch out for him yourselves because he is strongly opposed to our words. At my first defense, no one stood by me, but everyone deserted me. May it not be counted against them, but the Lord stood with me and he strengthened me so that the proclamation might be fully made through me and all the Gentiles might hear. And so I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil work and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then look down at verse 21. Make every effort to come to before winter. Make every effort to come before winter. Let's pray. Lord, as we consider your word today, I pray that you will show us who we are. Every individual might see who we really are. And then, Lord, show us who you are. And we'll give you praise in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Personnel director once said, out of all the references that we get for, to employ someone, he said, preachers and teachers are the most unreliable sources out there. And I, and I agree with that. Preachers and teachers, and I don't know about teachers because I'm not one, but I can tell you about preachers. Preachers will not always say what's really true if it's the least lit, little bad in it. They, they just won't say that. Obviously, he didn't know the preachers that I know. For the most part, preachers' references are, are they're not considered to be very reliable because they just understand that preachers are going to say the best that you can say about someone who is applying for a job. They just don't like to say anything bad. Well... <laughs> Paul wasn't that way. Paul would tell it just like it is. Paul would, he, Paul was one of those guys who would say, if you don't want to know, don't ask. Because he'd tell you, amen? He, he would tell you straight up. Paul called people out. If you look all through his writings, all through the epistles, all through his letters that he wrote, Paul called people out. Look at verse 10. Notice that he said, Demas has deserted me. And then look at uh, verse 14. 
Alexander the coppersmith did great harm to me. And then he adds, the Lord will repay him according to his works. I think that's a little sanctified vengeance, amen? <laughs> Look at verse 16. He says that no one stood by me, but everyone deserted me. May it not be counted against them. Well, I've noticed that in all of Paul's letters, He's always given these little mini bios of the many people that he served with and that he was associated with throughout his ministry. Have you ever noticed that? See, it's just these little mini bios that Paul had served with all throughout his ministry. These people are, I'm saying, are representative of everyone in this room. Every one of us. These people are representative of people throughout history and even us here today. And the reason I say that is because people don't change. Humanity doesn't change. People are people. You know when I figured that out? I figured that out in 2007 when I retired from my secular job and resigned my, my church. My and I sold everything we had. Everything. I mean, you, we could put everything we had in a suitcase. And we boarded a plane and moved to Saigon, Vietnam. One of the things that I looked for the most, I looked forward to the most, was the anonymity of being someplace where nobody knew me, no one knew anything about me. I, I was totally uh, hidden from everybody. No one knew me. And I looked forward to that. I was tired of being expected of to be here and to do that and, and to worry with everybody's problems and issues. And I was just tired and I just needed a break. And, uh, and so I was excited about going to Vietnam and no one would know me. We weren't there very long. When we left, when we flew over, we took two little dogs with us. One was a little black uh, poodle. Had her when I came here and she died just a few years after we came here, broke my heart. I love that little dog. And then we just had to put the other one down about two months ago, and that broke our heart too. But these two dogs went over with us. Well, we, all we had for transportation was a motorcycle, and so I built a little old car seat kind of thing there on the front of that motorcycle. And uh, I, I got them a, a leash, a, a halter, and put this halter on them, and I tied them to that basket so if they fell off, they wouldn't, it wouldn't be hurt. And so everywhere I went, I'm, I'm riding this motorcycle, and Maya's on the back, and here's these two little dogs right here. And everywhere we go, people would want to pet those dogs. Well, Reese, the little brown chihuahua, she wasn't real friendly. She didn't just appreciate anybody petting her. And she'd let them know. And once they found out about it, they'd, every once in a while, one of them would walk by there, and they'd just pop her on top of the head. <laughs> Boy, well, I wanted to knock him out, but I could, couldn't do that. You know, I just, just please leave her alone. <laughs> but here's the thing. I, did, I, I just wanted to be left alone and be hid. Here's a city of 8 million people. And within two months, we could go all the way across the city of Saigon. And everywhere we'd go, somebody would say, oh, I know who you are. You, you have the two dogs. There went my anonymity in two months. <laughs> I learned while I was there that people are people. That's just people. It doesn't, matter. it doesn't matter what country they're in. It doesn't matter the ethnicity. It doesn't matter. People are people. We all think alike. We act alike. We, we do alike. People are just people. Amen? Paul. Paul talks about three of these usual, typical people that I want us to look at today and to understand that they are representative of everybody in this room, me included. Hello, church. So, let's think about these who were co-workers with Paul and how they are seen in various times in the ministries of Paul's, Paul's work. I... I I want us to first look at Demas. 
Hmm. And I want us to think about this. No one ever conquers worldliness. Look at verse 10. Notice what he says. Demas has deserted me, but he loved this present world and has gone to Thessalonica. No one ever conquers worldliness. Are you with me, church? Watch this. Now, I, Maya's not, she, she might hit me when we get out of here, but I'm pretty safe as long as we're here because yesterday we were at the camp. We went down just to try to look at things and we, we had a lot of work to do, so we tried to do as much as we could. But on the way out of there, there was this really nice, nice place, and it's right on the, right on the water, and it's got a real nice boat. Out. Keith, you know the place I'm talking about, and it's for sale. I'm thinking it is, right? It's for sale now. So we're driving out of there, and, and Ma says, if I had the money, I'd buy that place. And then she, said, she got to thinking about it, I guess, because then she says, but you know what? I am perfectly happy with what we've got. I am, I'm so blessed to have what we have. We just have this little travel trailer that's parked down there on, on Keith's place. He's letting us stay there. And so we're, we're just really blessed to have a place we can go and, and get away and just her and I spend good quality time. And, and, and we love that. But she says, but I'm perfectly happy with what we have. And I said, you know what? We're... Where people are always looking for a little more, a little more. We get that, and all, oh, if I just had that, it, that, that's all I'd ever want. But no, when you got that, there would be something else. Amen or oh me, right? So, I, I believe that, that worldly, worldliness is, it, that's something no one will ever conquer. We, I don't care how spiritual you are. There will always be times in your life when you wish you had more, something bigger, something better, something greater. I may just be speaking from my own experience. Now, if you want to get a big picture of uh, this guy, Demas, you, you got to look through the scriptures. He's mentioned three times, only three times in the New Testament. The first time he's mentioned in Philemon, or the, the first time that I'm going to share with you, Philemon 23 and 24. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, Jesus spent, sends greetings to you. I, I, I love that. He, 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 he sends his best. Notice that he says, and so do Mark, not only Epaphras, but Mark. He's there with us. Mark. Aristarchus, excuse me, and Demas, and Luke. Notice what he calls them. We're going to talk about Mark, Demas, and Luke today, but he calls them my what? Fellow workers, my co-workers, my fellow ministers. These are men who walk with me, who talk with me, and we all share in the work together. The next time we might see him be in Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. Look. The beloved physician, Luke, the beloved physician greets you as does Demas. Now, I don't know about you, but there's something that just stood out in that verse. When, when you read about Demas and Philemon and then you read this verse, something just kind of stood out at that uh, for me. And I thought, you know, he, do, he doesn't really say a whole lot about Demas. He doesn't really say a lot about him. And sometimes silence says more than any amount of words. Did, did you know there's a verse in Revelation said in, there was, in heaven there was a silence of about a half hour, right? And, and all creation took note of that silence. Have you ever, have you ever walked into a room and there's, this, there's this, this talk going on across the room and then all of a sudden door opens, you walk in and it's instant silence. What, what do you think about? Uh, they've been hanging me. Right? Uh, they're talking about something they don't want me to know about. Must be about me. Uh, sometimes silence says a whole lot more than a dictionary full of words. Right? Amen? And for some reason, Paul doesn't say a whole lot about Demas here. As does Demas. I think we see Demas sliding away. And then you get to verse 10. 
You get to verse 10 where he says, says, Demas has deserted me because he loved this present world and has gone to Thessalonica. Shows a progression of spiritual, of a spiritual fade, a spiritual sliding away. This may, this may kind of ring a bell for several of us. Have you seen people who come and they, they get involved and boy, they get into that Sunday school class and they're really excited and they're building relationships and then all of a sudden you, see, you only see them about once or twice a month in Sunday school and, um, and, and you see them in worship but then all of a sudden you won't see them in Sunday school anymore and you'll only see them every great once in a while in worship and then all of a sudden well, not all of a sudden, but over a period of time, you, you, you don't see him at all. Have you ever seen that happen? There's this progression of fading away, of sliding away. It doesn't mean that Demas wasn't a Christian. I, I would imagine that Demas was. Can you imagine what it must have been like to have walked with the Apostle Paul, such as, as Demas did? Can, can you imagine what that must have been like? To hear him talk about all that Jesus had personally taught him, much more and way beyond what he'd ever taught those original disciples. Must have been exciting. No telling how many times Demas preached because Paul was busy over in this tabernacle or busy over in that part of the country and Demas would step in and preach for him. No telling how many people Demas baptized. No telling how many people Demas led to the Lord. But something happened. He started looking at the world around him. And he liked what he saw. Do, do you know what we preachers need to do less of, Brother Jameson? We need to stop talking about how evil our world is. Amen? No? Because it's, it, it, it's true in a sense, but it is also untrue. If, if you look out here at the things of this world, they're fascinating. They're amazing. And there's some things that I'd like to go do, but I know it wouldn't please the Lord. Now, I'm, some of y'all are looking at me like, we'll look in the mirror. You, you know there's some things out there that you'd love to be involved in too, right? Amen? Huh? I hear people give their testimony sometime and they talk about, uh, the world and how great the world is, it kind of makes me want to just go off and sin a little bit too. That just got to be a lot of fun. Did I tell you about the time my, my, we, I grew up in a house where we had a floor furnace. Y'all know what a, well, sure you do. You know what a floor furnace is, right? Grew up in a house where there was a floor furnace. And, and mom would always say, in the wintertime, it's cold up in Oklahoma. It it's, gets really cold. Mom would say, son, don't, don't, she'd call us to breakfast, don't, don't step on the floor furnace. I, I never could figure out why there was a rug over it in the, in the summertime, but that always uncovered in the wintertime. Mom would say, son, don't step on the floor furnace. You know what, I, I think mama's trying to prevent me from having fun. That's what mamas do, right? So I stepped on the floor furnace. You can look at the bottom of my foot like a miniature checkerboard. Here's what, instead of talking about how evil the world is, we need to start preaching about how good God is. If we'd preach about his goodness and his grace and his love and his mercy and, and, and his love for us, the world wouldn't look as good. Amen? We just need to talk more about the love of God. I don't know what happened to Demas. Did he get tired? Did he get weary? Did he get discouraged? You see, I, I've, I've gotten that way a time or two, like yesterday. Do you? We all do. We all get tired. and we get, Is that what happened to, is that what happened to Demas? Maybe, maybe the work just got too difficult. Maybe because at this time, Paul is in prison, 
And, and Demas was having to go every day and, and minister to him. Maybe this is just not what I thought it would be like. I, I, I thought it would be much more grandiose than this. I remember a time in the ministry whenever I looked up to the heavens and said, God, if this is all it is to it, I don't want it. I'm, I, I'm throwing a towel in. I quit. I don't want no more. It took me three or four years to get over that. But there was a time when I was so discouraged and so, so troubled, I, I didn't want it. Maybe that's where Demas was. Maybe. The scripture says he had a love for the world. You know that word love is a, is a word of value. We're not talking about an emotion here. We're talking about a, we're talking about a placement of value. Demas place a lot of value in the world and in the world systems. You say, why do I say that? Because for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. That word loved, God placed great value on his creation. So much so that he sent his son to die on the cross for us. That was the value of his creation. Demas looks at the world and he values the world more than he values the love of Christ. Notice what Paul said in verse 7. He says... I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. There is reserved for me in the future the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only me, but to all those who love his appearing. Paul had a love for the appearing of Jesus Christ, for the presence of Jesus Christ. Demas had a love for the world. I wonder if there's a Demas here this morning. I wonder if there is a, a Demas sitting in this room today beginning to slide away, beginning to fade away. In just a moment, I'm going to talk about Paul as I close this thing out in a moment. And I want you to think of how Demas began to slide away in where you are today. But I'll talk about that in a minute. I just would say, finish the course. Don't quit. Amen? Demas, quit. Finish the course. Stay with it. You might not win the race. You might come in last, but no one will ever call you a quitter. Finish the course. Secondly, 1 John 2, Paul, uh, John said this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Secondly, no one ever is useless in the work of the ministry. Look at verse 11. Notice what he says. He says, Only Luke is with me. What? You know, if, if, you, if you just kind of read it like that, it kind of sounds like Paul is saying, here I am in chains, and I'm in prison, and I need help, and I need, I need your ministry to me. I, I need, I have a lot of needs. And, 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 and Paul looks over, and there's Luke, and he said, only Luke. He's the only one here. But if you, if you say it like this, Demas left me for the world. Watch out for Alexander the coppersmith. Watch out for him because he'll hurt you. He hurt me. And these people have left, but thank God Luke is still here with me. Luke is right here with me. He's serving. He doesn't quit. Thank God Luke is here. No one is ever useless in the work of the ministry. Well, 
what is the work of the ministry? Is that just what we preachers do? Is that just what the deacons do? No, that's what every member of this church is involved in. That is the ministry of the work. Hello, church. Really? Every one of us are involved in the ministry, the work of the ministry. How do we do that? By exercising the spiritual gifts that every born-again believer has. You have at least one, possibly two, and that's how we work in the ministry. You know, the way it ought to be set up whenever we choose our ministry teams is it, it, it ought to be done by spiritual gifts. That's the way it ought to be set up. You ought to serve on the benevolence team because you, you, ought, you ought to have someone on there who, is, who has the gift of discernment. You need someone on there who has the gift of mercy. You need to have someone on there who has uh, the gift of giving. Amen? You need people like that to make up this team so that, so that whenever there is a need, they can correctly and, and effectively evaluate the need and meet the need, lead the church to meet that need. But we're all involved in the work of the ministry. Luke, I believe, was the most self-effacing man in the New Testament. You, you don't hear a lot about him. You don't read a lot about him. You don't hear a whole lot about Luke. Luke was with, he joined up with Paul and Troas. Uh, he, he worked with him through the, uh, through the book of Acts. In fact, he wrote the book of Acts. He went on this missionary, these missionary tours with Paul. But you, you just don't, his name is rarely mentioned. He's mentioned in Colossians 4.14. As the beloved physician, you see him there. He was a doctor. He, he was not only a physician. If you look at how he writes, he was a, he was a genius um, literary accomplished person. If you, if you, if you ever notice, his, his Greek, man, is top of the line. He was a master at the art of writing. Luke was a good man. What's he doing here? Why is Luke here? Well, let me give you some just cornbread and peas. Mike Scott School of Theology. He's here because he's a caregiver. And Paul had a thorn in the flesh that God chose not to take away. Hello? And I believe it's something very physical, something that needed ongoing attention. I don't know what it was. I have no idea. He'd just come out of a stoning from Lystra. Maybe that was it. As a matter of fact, uh, let's go back here first. Look with me, if you will, in 1 Corinthians. No, 2 yeah, Corinthians chapter 11. Or just follow along. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Th this is Paul. He's describing his time in the work. He says he's been in prison. We're beginning in verse 23. He's been in prison many more times. Far worse beatings. Near death many times. He says five times I received 39 lashes from Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods by the Romans. I was stoned by my enemies. Three times I was shipwrecked. I have spent a night and a day in the open sea. On frequent journeys I faced dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own, my own people, dangers from the Gentiles and in the city, and dangers in open country, dangers in the sea, and dangers from among false brethren. Labor and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger, thirst, often without food, cold and lacking clothing. Not to mention other things, there is daily pressure on me and my care for all the churches. I kind of understand how Paul must have felt. That's just some of the things that Paul endured. And then if you read on in the book of Galatians chapter 4, look at verse 14. You did not, this is Paul talking to the Galatians. He says, you did not despise or reject me, though my physical condition was a trial for you. What he actually says is, was repulsive to you. 
It was something so horrible and disgusting to look at. It was repulsing to look at Paul. That's what he's saying here. He said, on the contrary, you receive me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Paul was saying, no matter what I look like, Jesus loved me, and you did the same. Luke was a caregiver, and he was an encourager. And we all need caregivers at times, and we all need encouragers, right? Don't tell me you never get discouraged. You do. We all do. Third thing is, is no one ever is beyond forgiveness. Look again at verse 11 in our text. Verse 11 says, oh, he says, bring Mark with you, for he is useful to me in the ministry. And that's an interesting phrase. That's interesting that he would say that. Why? Well, if you look in Acts chapter, well, I, I won't turn there. I won't read all that, but we'll just look through it. In Acts chapter 12, verse 25, you listen as I read on. I will turn back there and look at that. Acts chapter 12, verse 25. Listen to this. After they had completed their relief mission, Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem, taking along John, who is also called Mark, or John Mark. So here's Paul and Barnabas, and they're... They've done this relief mission there, and, and they're, they're working in the ministry. And, and so uh, they returned to Jerusalem, and they took John Mark with them. In chapter 13, verse 5, says, well, let me back up to verse 4. He says, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they came to Seleucia, and from there... They sailed to Cyprus. Arriving at Salamis, they proclaimed God's message in the Jewish synagogues. They also had John as their assistant. So, boy, John is connected. Man, he's working. He is right there with them. Then look, if you will, at verse 13. We're in Acts 13, verse 13. Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Persia and Pamphylia. John Mark, however, left them and went back to Jerusalem got hot in the kitchen. So John Mark deserts and runs home to mama. Now, I, I, I don't know that I can explain all of that. You see, John was, Mark was a nephew, if, if I'm understanding right, was a nephew of Barnabas. Maybe Barnabas, maybe Barnabas just wanted for him so much for, for Mark to be in the work and to be there with them and to work hard. Maybe, maybe he kind of pushed him into that. Maybe his mother called him into the ministry. I, if you remember in Acts chapter 12 when they were praying for Peter's release and they had this prayer meeting, they met in, in Mary's house. That was John, Mark, John Mark's mother. So he was, he was brought up knowing uh, Jesus and uh, knowing about Jesus. And so it seems that he would naturally fit into that missionary work. But then we find out where he, he leaves. And then in Acts chapter 15, look at verse 36. After some time had passed, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brothers in every town where we have preached the message of the Lord and see how they're doing. And Barnabas wanted to take along John Mark. But Paul did not think it appropriate to take along this man who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone on with him to the work. There was such a sharp disagreement that they parted company and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed off to Cyprus. And then Paul chose Silas and departed. And after co uh, commending them to, uh, to the grace of the Lord by the uh, grace of the Lord by the brothers. So, so I'm running out of time and I'm trying to hurry. So he, here was uh, Paul and Barnabas who were, they, they were companions now all of a sudden there was a sharp disagreement. They had a falling out because Barnabas said, we're taking John Mark. And Paul said, no, we ain't. Barnabas said, oh, yes, we are. We're taking him. And Paul said, no, we're not taking him. I will not get on the same boat with him. Barnabas said, well, why not? 
because he deserted us in Pamphylia and he'll desert us again. Can you imagine Barnabas going to John Mark and saying, John, it's just you and I. And John Mark says, well, what about Paul? He's supposed to be going with us. Well, he's, he's not going to go. Well, why isn't he going to go? Well, John, just to be quite honest with you, he didn't want you to go along. Well, why? He just said he wouldn't go. So he's going with Silas, and that's all right. You're going to go with me. And they parted company, and they went their separate ways. You see, no one is beyond forgiveness because it's not long before uh, Paul has... Um, Mark brought to him. I'm trying to figure out where I want to go here. He says, bring Mark to me. Time had healed the wounds. Mark had done some growing. He'd become much bolder. Paul said, I need him. Demas has left me. He deserted me. All these others are gone. I still have Luke, but bring me John Mark. You see, no one is beyond forgiveness. Maybe you're a John Mark here this morning. A person in need of forgiveness. I don't care where you've been or what you've done. There's not anything that the shed blood of Jesus Christ will not take away. There is no sin it will not take away. John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Maybe you're in need of forgiveness. but Maybe you're a Paul and someone needs your forgiveness. Well, I've got to hurry. Doesn't need to be fatal. Have you ever failed at anything? Well, get ready. It's not the last time. Let me close with this. No one is ever not human in this life. Think about that for a moment. No one is ever not human in this life. Listen, the grace doesn't, how would I say that, dehumanize the body. We still have wants. We still have desires. We still have likes. We still have dislikes. Look at verse 13. Paul says, Paul says, you know that previously I preached the God. Oh, wait a minute. I'm in the wrong, I'm in the wrong passage. Look at verse 13 of our text. 2 Peter 4, verse 13. When you come, bring the cloak that I left in Troas. Br bring the cloak, that outer garment. Must be getting cold in that prison. Now he's already said go by and bring John Mark, but bring that cloak to me. Bring the cloak as well as the scrolls and especially the parchments. Now why would Holy Spirit inspire Paul to say, when you pick Timothy up, go by and get my cloak and bring it along with the scrolls and the parchments. It is not all scripture inspired by God? It's all God breathed, right? Is that inspired? Bring my cloak. What do you think? How, how, does that in, how does that challenge you, inspire you? Here's what I thought about. This is my thoughts on this, and it's not worth a whole lot, but I'll just throw it out there anyway. You, you think that Paul was a hard case? A lot of people do. Well, he was just a hard-nosed, hard-cased old missionary that had very little compassion, that had very little patience. He just called it like it is. And when he said he wanted it done, he wanted it done. Cold. Hard-hearted. A lot of people think that's what Paul was like, but Paul was not. He was a very compassionate man, a very loving person. When you come, bring the cloak I left in Troas with Carpus. Hmm.
I'm going to go out on a limb, and you can think I'm a nut job if you want to. This is just my personal opinion. I, I thought about why, why, why would this verse be in the scriptures? Bring me my cloak. Is there something spiritual about his cloak? Did it have some kind of divine message written on it? Why, why would it be in the scriptures? I think it's because, I think it's because the God of the scripture, I believe that, I believe that in his heart of hearts, Every little minute detail is important to him. Even having a cloak in a cold, dark prison. Listen, friend, you don't have a need that he doesn't know about. Amen? And if you'll trust him, he'll meet that need. I don't know how he does it, but he does. Paul talked about in that text, he said he's looking for that appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. He talked about his past and how hard it was, but right in the middle between that hard past, glorious as it was, but difficult, and that looking forward to the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ, right in the middle of that is this human need, the need for companionship and the need for warmth. Bring Mark. I need him for the work of the ministry. And bring my cloak, because I'm cold and I'm lonely. Have you ever, ever heard anybody say, well, I don't need anybody but Jesus. I don't need anybody. That's a foolish thing to say, because God created us for companionship. That's why he gives us husbands and wives. He created us. For companionship. Companionship with one another and with him. Amen. That is the humanness of Paul the Apostle. You may be here today and you may be saying, I don't need anybody but Jesus. I don't need the church. I don't need a Sunday school. But my friend, let me tell you something. You do too. You need it. Are you hearing me, church? You need it. And here's what will happen. Probably without exception, here's what will happen. When you begin to slide like Demas, and the world begins to look good to you, here's what will happen. If your church meets on a Wednesday night, first thing you're going to do is you're going to quit Wednesday nights. You're going to quit participating in the work of the ministry on Wednesday nights. And then if your church has Sunday school, you say, well, that's for kids. No, it's not. Sunday school is for every one of us because that's where we come and we build those special relationships in the church. That's where we come to get to know one another and get to understand one another and know where we all are in our walk of faith and in the spiritual journey, and we know how to minister to one another. Plus, the teaching of the word and how, applica how to apply the scriptures to our life. But you see, if you're fading and sliding away, you're going to slip away from Sunday school, and it's not going to be important for you. That's for all those people that don't know much and need to know more. I know all I need to know. <clears throat> Man, it's getting quiet in here. Amen? And then before you know it, they begin to slip away from Sunday morning worship when the church, when Paul says, or the, or the writer of Hebrews says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, even more so as you see the day approaching. But here's what will happen. You, you begin to slide away, slip away. There aren't any exceptions. That's the way it happens. So who are you this morning? Are you a Demas that is slowly fading away? Are you a Mark who failed, but failure is not fatal? There is forgiveness. Or, or, is, is Satan holding something over your head that, that 
He's convinced you that God will never forgive. Better think again. Scripture says his blood is enough. Or what about a Luke? Someone who's not seen very much, someone who's not someone who's rarely heard about. But oh my soul, anytime you see anything going on of any relevance, oh Luke is there. Yep. He's there. And the Apostle Paul, who one of the greatest men of faith it's ever been, who finds himself in a cold, dark dungeon, and he's cold and he's lonely. Oh, he must be backslidden. He don't need anybody. If he needs someone else besides Jesus, he must be backslidden. And why, if he just had enough faith, he wouldn't be there to start with. You've heard that kind of stuff. Maybe you're a Paul. God knows our frame. He knows that we are but dust. We have a divine treasure living in us. And we're supposed to operate in this human life under the power of Holy Spirit who lives in us. Which one are you? That's, only, that's a question only you can answer. Fathers, we close out this time together where we've come together and we've prayed and worshiped, sang, heard the word. I pray that we've heard Holy Spirit more than anything. And I pray that right now where we sit today, right where we are, every one of us, God, you would show us who we are. And then, Lord, show us who you are. We'll give you praise in Christ's name.